On today's Lockdown Guardians, we're going to get into some arbitration estimates. We'll debate who should stay and who should go. And then we're going to start our positional preview, where we'll look at the past, the present, and the future as we go position by position for your Cleveland Guardians. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. I am Jeff, the coughing man, Ellis. Uh, welcome to Lockdown Guardians. I want to thank you for making Lockdown Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever it is that you get podcasts. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Jeff Ellis. I've been the host of Lockdown Guardians since its inception. Before that, I was the lead draft and prospect analyst at Scout in 24-7. And I got my start way back in the day at Indians Prospect slash baseball insider justin how do they know you i am justin ladd and for those who are watching i am fighting with technology once again today i'm having a one of those battles but um i am here and i am from guardians baseball insider now as the uh, editor-in-chief slash managing editor all that good stuff you formerly indians baseball insider formerly indians prospect insider also the news herald and Lorraine Morning Journal, and previously with every Cleveland sports blog you can probably think of at this point. I've been with all of them. Uh, I do want to take a second here at the top of the show and remind you to go subscribe on YouTube. We are up to 786 subscribers. Getting to 1,000 is huge, 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 huge for us. So, uh, like I said, uh, if you got multiple accounts, make sure you subscribe on all of them. If you got a family or a friend who might like it, help them subscribe. I also do want to take a second to say uh, all, all reviews on iTunes, we would say a thank you for. So thank you to Sizemore24, Akron Banker, and B Goats1234, uh, Banker and Sizemore both uh, talking about how much they, all three of them actually talking about how much they enjoy the addition of Justin to the show. So thank you for leaving those reviews and a double thank you for the five star review. Uh, now that we got kind of business out of the way, let's get into baseball business. Let's talk arbitration. I know I didn't uh, set you up for this ahead of time, but in my grand tradition of just foisting things on you, do you want to <laughs> guess what team has the most arbitration eligible players? Ooh, um, off the top of my head. There are two Dodgers? that are significantly higher than everyone else. Uh, it's either, it's either got to be the Rays or the Dodgers. The Rays is the highest in 19 second or the Brewers oh, wow. at 18. Oh, okay. 19 for, yeah, 19 is a lot. Uh, there is a bunch tied with six, which is the lowest. Like you could, I feel like almost a third of the league, I didn't count them up. Uh, let see, the Rockies are at six, the Rangers, the Pirates. I mean, the Phillies are only at seven. Uh, let's see, in uh, Oakland is, of course, at six, as one would expect for a team with as low, uh, but also Atlanta only has six. So with the Rays have- having 19 ar- arbitration eligible players, then. Um, who is going to be involved in the annual Rays Guardians trade and who is Cleveland going to regret trading for now? We can we could probably go back real quick and talk about <laughs> last season's trade and let's see how they can avoid it this year. But if they have 19 they guys, you can bet the Rays will be active. The trade for Harold Ramirez back, right? I'm kidding. I, you know <laughs> yeah, who, no. who might be someone on this list who would honestly maybe make sense? So if the Rays have everyone healthy, you know, they went out and added Christian Betancourt because uh, Mike Zanino is hurt. Uh, there, or the question is, so I'll throw this to you. They have Francisco Betancourt's at 1.6. Is there a chance? I, I know this isn't locked on Rays, but this, this does go back to the Guardians. Do you think there's a world where they just designate Mejia for assignment rather than pay him 2.2 million? Yeah, I don't know. What did he do this year? I guess, yeah, I guess Zanino's coming back and you have. Bethancourt, Bethancourt, I would probably rather pay Bethancourt than Mejia. Yeah, Bethancourt's 600000 cheaper. Uh, Mejia is just at 645 OPS, 87 Ooh. OPS plus. You know, he doesn't do anything. Well. And this was, like, my concern. Like, you can go back to, uh, you know, I'm not going to name names, but there are some of those people who were, like, radio famous back in the day for calling into things. I'm not going to be a gatekeeper here. Uh, it wasn't Hiram. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I, I, people get mad at me when I was talking about trading Mejia back in the day. Because he's going to be a batting uh, title winner, and I'm like, Ooh. let's slow down on that. 
and B, when they have one tool and it's hit tool, that scares me. And anyone who listens to the show knows that's also why I'm lower on Freeman and a few other players. But that was a scary profile. I think there's some grounds for comparison with me and a few other players. If you look at some of the statistical performance of the minors, but I wouldn't pay him 2.2 at this point. He's not a good defender and he's not hitting like that's, that's a decent chunk of change. So maybe, maybe the guardians couldn't try to get Betancourt on the cheap because, uh, and they're certainly not going to trade for uh, Mejia back. Let's be honest. About uh, that no, one. I think they were pretty satisfied in trading him. Although, Hey, Brad hands going to the world series by the way. So good for him. Um, yeah. Yeah, not not a great defensive year for for Mejia. Not not a great yeah. uh, hitter. Yeah, I, I don't think that'll be he won't be. He will be. I would not tender him. Yeah, I don't. No. I don't the only two things he had going for him was contact rate and arm arm. Yeah, yeah it's a, a good arm profile. But yeah, yeah. he's you know that, that makes it. It's, this is a good segue too. Um, I remember when he came up and Jose Ramirez was like, "Yeah, this guy's you know there." People were talking about what he what mm-hmm. a great hitter Jose thought he was. Well. Jose thinks that another arbitration eligible player is a great player too. And um, very similar profile to Mejia, although his has worked out much better. But I'll say like, let's be honest about this too, before we talk about Ahmed, maybe diametrically opposed personalities. You and I both, there was, there was more smoke around Francisco Mejia. And I don't mean that like just in terms of like smoke and fire. I, I don't, don't take that as like, I never heard anything about him smoking anything. So I just, I want to be put that on front street when I'm saying there was smoke around him. I mean, I mean, chatter. Okay. Let me, let me clean that up. So no one like does a clip of this and then runs with it, but there was more negative chatter around him than many, any, maybe any prospect I'd heard coming up to the system. Whereas Ahmed seems to be like, just, Oh you know, yeah. Love. Like there are questions and concerns with Ahmed uh, in terms of, one, this is his final year because he had th- he played three years at the Mets before he got here. Two, the defense. Three, you know, an average-ish bat. It is very interesting if you look at him through the lens of baseball reference, which uses DRS, which you and I don't love, defensive run saved, versus uh, fan graphs, which uses outs above average and other things. Like, uh, baseball reference has him as a four-win player this past year because DRS liked Rosario. I, I mean, I, I felt like even in the few times in the postseason, we could see the range just isn't there. Um, you know, he got himself up to about average and kind of rest as the year went. I guess at the end of the day, though, it's like nine million dollars. That's a hefty chunk of change for this team. And for a guy who by like the, you know, the website that's war is more using advanced metrics and data. I, uh, nine million for a two win player is, you know, it's not terrible. Like I think we've seen wins. I'm not sure what wins are worth right now. I feel like in the past they're worth about five. So I guess technically, you know, he could be worth up to 10, but yeah. What do you think about a med at $9 million? Yeah. I was just kind of looking at the the salary projections for next year for Cleveland. And after you factor in arbitration, they're sitting Maybe somewhere. Well, right now it only says tw- twenty-eight. No, thirty-eight. They have thirty-eight million in, in projected arbitration salary. So, with their current guys in the roster and the arbitration guys, their projected salary would go up to seventy-one million. That's if they if they meet all of the arbitration figures going into next year. Um, and I think that's right. I mean, what the payroll this year was? What did it end up at? Like in the sixties um, at the end of the year. <clears throat> I think it ended up kind of mid to low sixties. Ended up in actually ended up at seventy seven if you count retained salary and um, signing bonuses and all that stuff. So they ended up it was fifty six total adjusted salary oh, seventy seven. Uh, a higher amount for Jose this past year, right? Yeah, so it ends up at seventy seven. So actually seventy one if it goes down next year would actually be a lot lower. Um, so we'll see. Down, I think. Though. I think. Like, is that just like well, it's weird that it's going down? Like something feels not right because like outside of excising Shaw, no one else is getting taken off, and a lot of salaries are getting significant jumps. So I feel like well, it just has it just has the the pre arbs the and the arbitrations here on on Spotrack. And yeah, I don't always love. Like sometimes any, they have some weird stuff. Well, the, you got to remember, there's also bonuses too. There was a signing yeah. bonus for Jose this past year. There was a signing bonus for. 
Class A. There was a signing bonus for Miles Straw, mm-hmm. and there was a, a bunch of weird stuff for Brian Shaw that included incentives. So <laughs> none of that's currently on the 2023 payroll either. Okay. So we could we could see um, how things go there. But knowing, I mean, yeah, I think they're they're projecting about 71 for next year. Um, yeah, especially when Bieber is projected at 10.7, I feel like yeah. it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to value. Bieber and Rosario making pretty much close to the same salary next season, considering, you know, Bieber, you know what he is of your staff. Yeah. And, and considering the Cleveland's got alternatives in the system they could go to, it doesn't necessarily mean those alternatives are ready next season. Yeah. And they're going to be, but that's the difference between the final step and, you know, being what two more steps out, you know, it's, you got two years of control on Bieber. It also goes to show like, he pitches like he did this year. He's going to be looking at like probably closer to 18. And then the final year, he'll be in the 20s. Uh, well, I think what it really comes down to is I think what it comes down to is this Cleveland is not going to, obviously, not non tender Rosario. Like he's, he's definitely going to get his money, whatever, you know, whether they settle mm-hmm. just under nine or whatever happens, he's going to get that money. He's not going to be non tendered. The yeah. question is, is there a trade market? That's that's what it's going to come down to. Just if, if Cleveland decides, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately they do not want to pay Rosario $9 million, then then they're going to have to work out a trade because, like I said, they're not going to non-tender him. So I guess it depends on what you think the trade market for Rosario is, whether Cleveland pays him or they trade him. It's hard to see the trade market just because, A, there's a few short stops he'll be available in free agency. Uh, some big names, and then B, it's like teams teams have a lot of internal options. Like it's, I I thought there were points last year, early on in the year, where maybe the Angels would have made sense, but I mean they're going through so much upheaval and turmoil. Turmoil. I I don't know. It's hard to find a situation that makes a ton of sense. And then for everyone who's like resign him, if he's getting nine million this way, I mean I'm assuming he's going to ask for like something like. 12 million to start in the first year of a contract, possibly with escalators, likely with escalators over a, a four to five year deal. So it's like, are you willing to spend 50 million plus on Ahmed Rosario? Because I feel like he's probably going to want a $50 million deal uh, if he right. plays all of next year. Are you, uh, how comfortable would you feel giving Ahmed Rosario $50 million for his late 20s into his early 30s? Yeah, he's going to hit. Free agency at age twenty seven. So if you're talking five years, fifty million, you're talking that's up to up to through through age thirty two. I, I think his skill set's going to hold up just fine. Like he makes enough contact when you're not concerned about that, and obviously he doesn't you know have to range your shortstop as we said. The speed probably will have enough. You know, he has enough speed where it's going to probably carry him for a little bit. Like you know, if he loses a step, he's still a great runner. I mean. What was he this year? Uh, 96 on sprint speed. So <clears throat> in six years, you could still probably guess he's in like the 70th, 80th percentile. Um, not that he's ever had a great chance to use all that speed. This is what he stole 18 bases this year. That's great. Um, 24 is his career high. Yeah, I just I can't see a team that has stockpiled so many shortstops in, in middle infields or <clears throat> unless they all just decided that these guys just weren't it. I can't see them pivoting and saying, okay, we're going to sign Rosario long-term and then we're going to trade Brian Rocchio. We're going to trade Gabriel Arias. We're going to trade Tyler Freeman. We're going to trade Angel Martinez. I mean, yes, one of those guys is getting traded, but maybe even two. I don't know. Yeah. And I think, I think the Rosario, like they're okay. So you have Trey Turner. We have Xander Bogarts who we're pretty sure is going to opt out. Mm -hmm. And then you have Watson and Correa. Okay. So we have four, Four big shortstop free agents. You have yeah. Turner, Bogart, Swanson, and Correa are your big guys. Um, you got what the Yankees who have Volpeck. Yeah, they're probably not going to do it. The Braves are going to need somebody, whether it's bringing Swanson back or somebody. Um, you can bet that the the Dodgers are going to need a shortstop. Dodgers are going to move uh, bets back to the infield. Shift around uh, Lux to shortstop and sign Aaron Judge. Ooh. Didn't you see that talk today? I did see that. I mean, I can't see Lux going back to shortstop. I don't think that's an, a great 
first position for him. Um, You're moving bets back. He's going to second. So Lux is going. I mean, I agree with you. I'm just saying. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, mean, okay. So Red Sox, Braves, probably the Phillies, I think are going to go after a shortstop. And then you've got maybe the Dodgers. And, got, and, the, and the, and the, and the, and the, well, I think, I think the Philadelphia would probably sign. If they sign like Turner, they would probably, Turner could play second or short. So it'd be a good fit for them. Um, but I mean, I think, I think those are your teams that are going after shortstops and, and the twins, I don't think Cleveland's trading with the twins, but I'm just saying there is a kind of a musical chairs here. Shortstop. Someone's going to miss out. I think. And I could see to the, the Cardinals being shortstop. Um, you know, they've needed a shortstop the past few years, but I feel like they kind of figured it out this year. Was it Tommy Edmond who mostly played? He played third base for them. I'm trying he to think of at the end of the year. Yeah, I feel like they someone played decently well for them at some point, and now I'm blanking. Uh, unless that was Sosa, who they later on traded to Philly. He's part of their team. Uh, yeah, Tommy Edmond was playing shortstop at the end of the year, and, I mean, he has played so much all over. I mean, that Paul yeah, DeJong. Yeah, defensively. Yeah, because they've got an issue, like where they're going to play Gorman, where they're going to play. I mean, they've. Yeah, St. Louis would make an interesting yeah. trade partner just from that perspective of like Lars Notebar on top of having a fun name. Like it took them a while to figure out how to get him in the lineup. They just have so much depth. Yeah. I saw someone, I don't even remember what the offer was, but someone trying to figure out a trade for Tyler O'Neill. I would, I would absolutely love that. Um, yeah. From there, yeah, so you got Braves, team. Braves, Red Sox, maybe, maybe the Yankees. I don't know, Twins, and then I yeah, mean, maybe the Yankees want a place, uh, a placeholder. Like, maybe it they, makes well, sense. They do that. I feel like they do with IKF this year. I, yeah, I, I can't, yeah, they have IKF. Yeah, good call. The thing, the thing with Rosario is like, are okay, let's say Rosario is not back next year. Are you comfortable with Arias or Freeman? Because I Rokio, I think we can agree, is not going to start the year at shortstop. There's no way. He has like a handful of games in Triple A. So, are you comfortable with Freeman or Arias taking over shortstop at, at, on day one next year? Can Can I throw like a great idea at you? Oh, what Jimenez happens, short. Yes. What happens if Cleveland locks up Jimenez at second base prices because he played second base all this year? Uh, maybe tries to get a discount by having him play the cheaper position and then moves him promptly to shortstop after camp where no one else can quite handle the position. Yeah, and then you could put Arias or Freeman Freeman. second base to start the season. Yeah, put them at a less physically demanding position. I know without the shift, when people are arguing that second base will have more defensive value, I think that's overblown. Like, it's going to be the same. You know, having range is great, don't get me wrong, but, like, it's, you know, I saw, you know, Saros kind of come back on that as well and say, no, it's probably not going to be a huge advantage in terms of well, second base. Arias can play anywhere, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Arias will be fine at third, short, or second. So, I mean, but, okay, I guess it's a question of the bat. Like, yeah, Rosario didn't have, like, an amazing year. He had a, a 103 way to runs created plus. He yeah. had 11 homers. He was an field. average player. Right. Do you feel like Freeman or Arias, if, if they decide to move on from Rosario and they decide that, you know, I don't know. We haven't decided who the future is yet, but if they start yeah. the year with one of those three playing second and short, do you feel like Rosario, or I'm sorry, do you feel like um, Arias or Freeman is ready to step in and put up at least a 103 well, way to run create a plus? The counter argument is if they don't, the $9 million you saved, if used in another way, could it be more valuable? Could you upgrade another position at a greater percentage? So let's say you think that and we're, I know we promised a positional review, um, but I guess we're going to kind of do some up the middle debate instead. Uh, it's <laughs> like, could, you know, if, if let's say Arias is like a 90 runs creative, so he's 10, 13 percentage points lower, but you can use that extra 9 million to sign someone like Brandon Drury, who would have been second on this team in home runs. And I think had like a, you know, a one, I'm not, you know, I want to say in the teens for his, it's like, can there be ways that you end up using that money effectively to help uh, to, to, for a greater value than you would get based just offensive value and non-positional based value? Uh, and I'm going to kind of leave it there. Come back. I want you to ruminate on that because we we need to take our first break here at nearly 20 minutes in. So uh, we will think about that. We will be right back on today's Locked On Guardians. 
I mean, our first sponsor is one of the best. I just have to say that not because anyone is telling me to. That is literally my opinion. Why do I love Bet Online? Well, one, they've been with us forever, and I appreciate anyone. I appreciate loyalty. I appreciate the places that have been with us. And two, listen, when I was sitting there writing my mock draft, I was going to Bet Online to see what the odds were for the top overall pick. Yes, no one got it right this year, but Bet Online was a great source of information. It goes deeper than just, you know, the lines. You can find so much great information on things like the draft. You know, I, I will throw the other example. While no one got the MLB draft right, uh, sites like Bet Online got the first pick in the NBA draft right. So just something to keep in your back of your mind. It's your number one source for betting football and the start of basketball. As always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all of your sports waging information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport. Head to the website today or you use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online, where the game starts. Okay, Justin, what are your thoughts? Can you use that money and end up balancing that? I think that's the better play. I mean, again, it depends on what you end up doing with Rosario because, again, we just said he's not going to get non-tendered. So you either have to pay him that money or, or settle with him or get to trade him. And somebody else pays them. There's, I don't think non-tendering is an option. So I think the better option is to reinvest his $9 million elsewhere. You have other options. I mean, th- and this is by all, no means a, a guarantee of anything, but Ahmed Rosario last two years, a 731 and a 715 OPS. Gabriel Arias by Zips um, has Arias at 722 and 766 the next two seasons. So, it's it's about the same. You get less some some less uh, less deals, a few more homers, and probably better defense. Maybe a little more yeah doubles and maybe less double plays. I don't know. So here's the thing. Uh, I was just kind of curious. Amongst qualified shortstops on FanGraphs, he was 14th in runs created plus, like literally middle of the pack. And in terms of WAR amongst qualified shortstops, he was 15th, literally middle of the pack. Again, we're not saying he isn't. Solid. I think our problem is more that he's an average shortstop. Like he is the definition of average. Yeah. And when you are the Cleveland Guardians and you don't spend any money, uh, hopefully it's going to change with new minority ownership and with a good chunk of this team. You know, listen, the minute they lost Sherman and that team had to, part of the team had to go into that trust. And that's when they cut payroll massively. So maybe things will change. Mm-hmm. I have no problems running them out for one more year. Let Rokio cook a little longer and right. see what he can do. Uh, I am fine with Arias being like the Owen Miller for next year. Like sign me up for that. But yeah, I think that's what we're getting at. Um, do you have any more final thoughts or should we move on to some of these other fun numbers uh, in arbitration? Yeah. Again, we'll talk about Shane Bieber, but Rosario is projected to get 1 million less than him in free agency. Do you feel like paying your middle of the road shortstop is almost as much money as your best pitcher who is a Cy Young winner? That's what it, that's, an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah. Uh, speaking of interesting, before we get to Bieber, how about that Cal Quantrell is getting six million, which is interesting because Shane Bieber got six million last year at about at the same step. Like Quantrell, uh, Bieber would have been a three point oh nine. Quantrell is projected to get six million at a three point one three. So he's projected to get what Bieber got last year when Bieber is already a multi time All Star. It's a young candidate. I know Quantrell has been a you know, reliable starter the last two years, but is that a little bit surprising to see Quantrell already at six when, again, that is Bieber's estimate for what Bieber got this year? Yeah. Is is Quantrell, was he a super two? Because I know there were a couple of guys that came over in that trade that got close. I know yeah. Naylor was a super two. He's only got, I mean, um, like I said, he's at the only three-year cutoff. I know super two doesn't affect like how much time. It's just money. Uh, so he was, was at a two point here. Yeah, he was a super two because he got two point five last year. Yeah, I think that probably has something to do with it. Yeah. He got arbitration a year earlier than Shane Bieber, so that probably has that's, a little bit to do. And that's with why that. you see why te- you know you always wonder why teams delay so, promotion. Yeah. Like that's it because if Quantrell's in a super two, he makes league minimum instead of making two point five last year, and this year instead of making six, he'd be making two point five. Like that's, so, you've got. You've got Quantrill making six. You've got Plesac yeah. making almost three. So let's it's two point nine. We'll call it three. That's nine million. And you've got Savali at two point two. So you're talking uh, eleven point 
two million for also let's say eleven point one million for three of those because the back half of your rotation. And I know a lot of teams would love that, right? That's that's yeah. pretty affordable for the back half of the rotation. But uh, I kind of feel like one of those three is not coming back next season. Yeah, you do wonder. And again, so Plesak is weird. Uh, and I don't mean that against his personage. I mean, because that whole COVID situation in 2020 where they, where the team told, where the players told the team to send those guys down. Like they asked for sanctions against Clevenger and Plesak because of what they did. Like the, the team was mad. Um, and when he got sent down, it made it so Plesak didn't get the extra year. So the, div- the deal between the Players Association and the Guardians was essentially Cleveland would keep that extra year of control, but they would make him a Super 2. So even though, technically speaking, he didn't qualify for arbitration last year, due to that is why he is getting arbitration. Like, if anyone's out there going, how did that happen? That's why he is a weird situation. So the bonus is he still you still have three years of team control on a guy who has looked every bit of a back-end starter. And back-end starters in free agency are going to cost you somewhere between eight to $12 million, depending on how aggressive things get. So there's a lot of value. And I still wonder with Plesak, with the fact that he just, you know, I, I did a whole podcast about when he got let go by his agency. It's like, he's never done anything terrible. He's done a lot of small things, but when your agents let you go, when you're already making millions, it, it he just must be exhausting. Like, am I, am I putting too much on him or, do you think he is the one, I guess it comes down to this. Like, do you go with Plesak who uh, some little thing happens every year? Or do you go with Savale who can only do 20 starts in a season? I guess if anything, I go with Plesak. Cause I feel like Plesak could be at least be a reliever if anything happens. And Savale, I think we have shown is not yeah. necessarily going to be a reliever. I don't know if this is a good comparison, but uh, like Steven Matz, I think is a good example of what you just said. A uh, career, a 430 ERA. He got, four years, 44 million last season in the off season. Lefty. Like, and he had a, yeah, he had, right? well, no. that does make a difference. Yeah. He's a lefty, right? Am I wrong? He is a lefty. I, I guess I don't know if that makes a difference. Okay, so that but, gives him a little more, but I think we get paid yeah, a little more uh, with that, but I mean, still we're talking like it's at least, you know, at low end, it's still going to be like nine to 10 million and he's getting under three. Two. Yeah. He'll, he'll, I don't know. His his market will be interesting this offseason, what they do with him. I mean, you're gonna give Naylor whatever tender him, it's three and a half for him. Mm-hmm. Karen Shack's only getting one point four. I think you're definitely gonna tender him. I don't know what they'll do, but I think they'll tender him. Um I think Luke Maley they'll probably non tender. I can't imagine they'll one point three. It's kind of crazy to think that Christian Betancourt with you know his background gets one point six. But again, Luke Maley is at five point one four eight years. I was kind of surprised mm-hmm. he's got five years under his belt, um, even though he's been an up and down guy. And that's you know again that's what stands out. Like I think uh, if I went back and looked up Tampa, it's like Betancourt isn't even at year five yet, and that's why he's a little bit cheaper compared to someone like. Uh, well, he's right about the same cost as Melee. Yeah, Betancourt's in only three years. So, yeah. and then Anthony goes. Think- I think we both both agree like he's going to be let go. They're not going to take up that roster spot at his age with that injury. Though neither of us would be shocked, I think, at the same time, if he came back on like a camp invite or a minor league contract. Yeah, he's not going to pitch at all in 2023. No. So I, I would I would guess they'll non-tender him and they'll give him like a – you could see getting like a two-year deal. Yeah. Um, or like I, I, I said, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be shocked by a prove-it type of camp invite again. He's – I guess you can't give somebody a two-year minor league deal because no. I would say if you give him a two-year deal, he can, you can basically give him something cheap this year while he's, he's recapping. Be, and then, he'll be thirty-three before he ever pitches again. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you can do the incentive deal. I think no. you have to. Uh, well, okay, but there's no point in doing a minor league deal if you can't do a two-year two-year minor league deal. Then he doesn't get to pitch next year. And what's the point well, of giving him a minor league deal? You know, I guess the thought is do a minor league deal. Maybe you can and add him to the, you know, an injury addition and then put him on the 60 man. Uh, you can build some, you know, some good feelings. And then maybe he accepts like a, you know, a similar deal or, you know, may listen, I know you're not supposed to make deals like uh, one where it's like, Hey, we'll give you this two year contract uh, essentially back to back. 
but we'll, you know, we'll put you on like, we'll take or, care of you. Or you Go could ahead. give him a minor league deal. And then next season, when the season's over, instead of letting yeah. him become a minor league free agent, you add him yeah, to no 40. Reason. If you feel like he's yeah. back and healthy and then you're back to where you were a year ago. Yeah. So yeah, and minor league deal makes sense. Full year to check him out. Uh, before we get too much deeper in this, let's take our next break, uh, then come back and, you know, just, discuss arbitration numbers a little bit more it is you know nine players we said that's more than a third of the roster so it's definitely something we want to dig into right now so uh we'll be back after the break and we'll continue to get into you know the numbers which are significant we're talking about 30 million dollars for a team that's over half the payroll on today's lockdown guardians and we have returned uh from our quest let us continue to discuss these arbitration numbers. So, you know, I think you and I both agreed, you know, Go- Goose and Maley probably gone. Is there anyone else on here you think has any chance at all of being uh, not retained? Um, no, I don't know. I feel like they'll tender a contract to play second Savali just because they're going to want to explore their trade value. Same with Karen Jack, same with Quantrill. I did see some Cubs fans out there tweeting today about, you know, Cal Quantrill would be a great target for the Cubs. We can get into that maybe another time. Yeah. I, I would imagine <laughs> yeah, Maley and Ghost are the only guys that get non-tendered here. What about, uh, you know, we kind of glossed over him earlier. Josh Naylor is an interesting player at 3.5, mostly because, you know, he is, Let's see. Last year, he was a super two. So he got 1.2, and that's why he's already up to 3.5. Uh, he He's also interesting because you go through like his, he's got some interesting age comps. You got some things with him. This is his first year that he was above league average. He has been, uh, and I'm not saying this to be like, oh, he's a bad player. It, it's completely the opposite. He is someone who is emerging. When you look at these list of players, because, I mean, I also say on Twitter, I saw a lot of people being like, you know, uh, Naylor isn't part of the core. Uh, so my question is, this group, just this group, this is not, you know, Andres, this is not Tristan, this is not some of the guys we've kind of talked about for extensions. I think you and I both agree Shane Bieber wants to go to greener pastures, that he probably, he's going to get, prohibitively expensive. So he might, like I said, he, he might be looking at close to 20 million in a year. So he might get traded then. Uh, but mm-hmm. who on this list, is it Quantrell? Is it Naylor? Is it Karen Chalk? Who could be up for an extension? Who, and who do you think they should even consider that with? Uh, I don't, and the arbitration list. Yes, just this list. Like, is there who would we put at number one if we're saying okay, they have to they have to extend one of these guys? I'm saying you can't. You have to extend one. That's that's my random arbitrary rule. Who are you picking? That is a that is a tough list to do it at, but uh, I guess I'd say Quantrill because he is the most reliable guy on the list, and he's going to be the most expensive as you continue to go through arbitration, like out of anybody. Cause he's like, you said, he's already at 6 million. He was a super two last year. Um, he's going to get four a total of four years of arbitration. This is only his, is he a free agent after next year? Is that what I'm looking at? Uh, no, he's not till after the 2025 season. Yeah. I mean, you're not really desperate to buy out his age. Um, yeah. He's currently 20 season. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what the extension looks like, but he's you know he's got three more years of team control after this. Yeah, 23, 24, 25. And that puts him at age 30 as a free agent. I don't know. I guess he's I guess no, he'll be 31 because he'll turn 28 before the season. So you're getting him at 28, oh, yeah. 29, and 30. So this, this ends at age 31. Uh, obviously, we're leaving Bieber out of this, right? Yeah, I, just under the assumption that, I mean, <laughs> you and I both agree that it's... Yeah. Uh, I, and again, it... Yeah, there's a degree of money, but I, I don't know. I this is not based on like inside intel at all, but just a few little things here and there. I think he kind of wants to go back to the West Coast where he's from. That's that's yeah, been my guess, thing. Yeah, I guess Cal is your most like safe guy in this group that you, you know, he gave you 100 and 880 innings this year. He's pitched in 72 games over the last two seasons, and 
Uh, 54 of them have been starts, and he's given you, you know, close to 300 innings over the last two years. So, yeah, I guess I'm going with Cal out of that group. That's uh, yeah, it's it's, it's at least a reliable guy, and and it's not like he's going to cost a ton of money either. So, he's the most high reliable guy in that group that you feel like is okay with an extension. Yeah, because it's hard to give one to a first baseman. It's like you know, you look at Naylor, and he kind of matches up with age and everything else, man you can pretty much find a decent first baseman every year in free agency. Uh, there's just always one or two guys that seem to be out there. So that makes it hard. It, it is, you know, th- there's part of me that thinks that maybe it's Karen chalk. If you can get him on a relatively sweetheart deal, cause he's at a low end and he's good. The other part is, is if you lock him up and maybe increase his trade value as well, I, I don't know. But yeah, it's I probably lean your way as well. Uh, the only thing that has it makes me hesitant is the fact that you're like, well, you've got him through age thirty, so. Wow, yeah, I don't, know, yeah, I, don't know what, I don't know what value you're really buying there. That's the thing. Like, what's what value are you really getting from Karen? Well, Jack, if he pitches uh, well again, Quantrill. oh, with I was gonna say with Quantrill, it's like if he pitches well again, he's gonna be up to like nine next year, and then he'd probably be in his final year. I would bet somewhere in the mid teens. So it's like. You know, so you would at, save money that way with Quantrell. It's like, yeah, it's like if he's going to cost you 15 million in year five, it's like, you may just choose to not take that final year of his contract. Um, you know, he might then be someone you consider designated for assignment. It's just, it's, it's something interesting to look at. Cause again, the, you know, Quan is obviously not close. Uh, Jimenez, I believe next year, um, McKenzie would likely be next year as well. The, the real interesting extension guys are those players. Um, mm. Well, and, and they also want to get those done pre-arb too. They don't want to get yeah. to arb. That that's the thing. They have not really extended guys. Once they get to arb, it's just unlikely they even do that. So was straw Raven. arb? I feel like straw might have already been arb. I'd have, wrong to, I'd have to look for. But sure. He's been around for know. a bit. I mean, he is older. Yeah, I don't know. A, a, un, a unique case, though, given his age when they got him and the fact that... Yeah, he, he was at... Uh, no. That's weird. Doesn't have any salary before 2022. Yeah, he was not at ARB. He was he, no. He's only at two years of service time now, so he would just yeah. be going to ARB this offseason. Yeah. So they got him pre-ARB. As they do. Yeah, it's... Uh, Which tracks. Yeah. No, and, you know, Class A, if he hadn't had the suspension, would have been ARB, but... Uh, maybe him, yeah. back. that suspension was the best thing that happened to us because uh, that allowed that deal maybe to get done that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So, right, uh, you know, it's uh, always got to look for that rainbow, that bright side. Uh, we, you know, we did, I, I promised at the top we do a positional review, we kind of did. We will be getting fully into those positional reviews. I, like, I know people are doing across network, you know, where we will talk about the present, the future, and uh the past of a position that is coming up. Also a reminder to send us your trades. That's all we had one on yesterday's YouTube show. I know Justin said someone sent him one. So send us your trade ideas and we're going to evaluate those as well. And uh, yeah, we're, and again, your call to leave a download daily review, subscribe. All of that is much, much appreciated. Any other thoughts on this one, Justin? No, let's uh, let's get those trade reviews for sure. Let's focus yeah. on one player per episode, and let's uh, let's dive deep on what we think about these guys and the potential trades. So let's everybody pick one player to focus on, and let's get multiple trade reviews. We'll pick a we'll pick one player per day, and we'll take all your reviews on them. So get those in. Uh, and for Lockdown Guardians, I just want to say, go go Guardians, go.